I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar program today. I am Sharbil Abu Diwan, the Director of Medical and Scientific Affairs with Nova Biomedical. I will be your moderator for this webinar on overcoming confounding issues in point-of-care glucose measurement, sources of glucose meter inaccuracy. We are happy to have two great speakers with us today, Dr. Kathleen Dungan, an Associate Professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism from the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, and Dr. Kathleen Wynn, also an Associate Professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. In her 2007 article, Glucose Measurement, Confounding Issues in Setting Targets for Inpatient Management, Dr. Duncan identified the challenges hospitals faced using point-of-care glucose meters for tight glycemic management uh, of patients. In this webinar, Dr. Duncan will revisit key topics, including the lack of standard glucose level targets for critically ill patients, conditions and interfering substances that may cause inaccurate glucose results, and measurement differences among specimen types. She will also discuss the impact of technology improvements in glucose meters. And her colleague, Dr. Wynn, will describe risks related to capillary glucose testing and present her organization's approach to determining which patients are eligible for testing with capillary specimens. Dr. Wynn will present several case studies illustrating how to effectively incorporate capillary sampling into point-of-care glucose monitoring. Before we begin, there are a couple of housekeeping items. Anytime during the program, you can type your question uh, in the box provided below, and then at the end of the program, the presenter will, will be able to answer these questions. Shortly after the end of the program, you will receive an email with directions for receiving continuing education credits. A recording of this program, along with other on-demand programs, will be available on Nova Biomedical's website. And with this, I will allow Dr. Dongan uh, to begin her presentation. Hi, I'm Kathleen Dungan. I'm an endocrinologist at The Ohio State University, where I oversee our clinical operations and many of our clinical trials. And I'm going to be discussing overcoming uh, the confounding issues that happen in hospitalizations in terms of point of care glucose measurement. The objectives that I'm going to cover today are the first two on this slide. We're going to discuss glucose targets for critically ill patients and uh, describe how various interfering substances and to some extent conditions might affect the accuracy of point-of-care glucose testing results. So the glucose targets in hospitalized patients really should be individualized, but in a general sense, the target is 140 to 180, and this is based upon multi-center randomized controlled trials that were actually done in the intensive care unit. There is a, a reasonable lack of evidence outside of the ICU, but those same targets apply throughout the hospital. There might be some room for tighter targets in some populations. In particular, the cardiac surgery patients may benefit, and it may be uh, possible at some institutions where it can be demonstrated to, uh, to be performed safely. On the other hand, a very tight glucose target in that 80 to 110 milligram per deciliter range has demonstrated a lot of significant and uh, severe hypoglycemia, and it's been associated with increased mortality. And therefore, it's really discouraged to uh, target that range. On the other hand, a glucose target of greater than 180 is going to tend to result in more fluid and electrolyte shift because that exceeds the threshold for glucosuria from the kidney 
and also is associated with impaired immune function and wound infections, as well as other possible infectious complications. And therefore, we're left with this range of 140 to 180 in um, most patients, and that is until we're able to get further data um, that might help individualize those targets for specific populations. So in general, when we're measuring glucose, it's very important that we have accuracy when we're considering how to implement therapy and how to adjust therapy. When you have lower glucose values, the, the error of a glucose measurement tends to be a little bit higher. And that is one impediment to achieving very tight glucose control. And there are also some studies that demonstrate limited data in that hypoglycemia range, making it difficult to really be confident that if we're going to attempt intensive glucose control, that that can be achieved safely. And this is really critical because there are a number of potential ramifications of hypoglycemia. There are well-known clinical consequences, including an increased risk in mortality. In some cases, it can be considered causal. In other cases, it might be considered to be uh, related to general um, comorbidity and uh, decline in the, the patient. It's also been associated with arrhythmic events, ischemic events. When it's severe, it can result in seizures. Even moderate hypoglycemia can result in imbalance and falls, which are a major concern in the hospitalized patient. Hypoglycemia may cause some cognitive dysfunction, and it has been fairly well described that hospitalized patients have some impaired recognition of hypoglycemia regardless. And then finally, hypoglycemia is simply a barrier to achieving glucose control. There are a number of economic ramifications. It is associated with an increased hospital length of stay, for example. And hypoglycemia is associated with a number of factors that make it um, difficult for a patient to um, to to be agreeable um, to more intensive treatments, including insulin therapy, and many of these patients are new to insulin. Over the years, the requirements for FDA approval and for accuracy of glucose monitoring devices have become more stringent. The most recent guidelines have specified that 95% of results should be within 12 milligram per deciliter of the reference range if the glucose is less than 75 milligram per deciliter. And 95% of results should also be within 12% of the reference if the glucose is greater than 75 milligram per deciliter. And this was somewhat of a compromise based on what, is what would be considered ideal accuracy versus what would be considered acceptable accuracy. And there are several methods of analyzing glucose, particularly in hospitalized patients, that we should call out. First of all, by far most common is the bedside glucose monitoring or point of care glucose monitoring. These methods generally require the smallest sample size of, of any of the methods. They have the shortest turnaround time. They're extremely portable from bedside to bedside. They are accurate but have some limitations, including accuracy that can um, at times be affected by things like medications, oxygen saturations, pH, hematocrit, 
And in ICU patients, as we'll learn, uh, capillary sources may be affected more so than other sources of blood. By comparison, typically blood gas analyzers tend to require more larger sample size. Uh, they have a fairly short time to resolve, but it's still longer than that point of care assay. They are typically on a unit, like an intensive care unit or, or a cardiac unit, but generally not portable from bedside to bedside. They are generally more accurate than most point of care methods, um, but they are more complex. So they require more additional training. Agents often have to be re refrigerated. There are some risks if the primary source is an arterial line, for example, for infections and thrombosis. And so typically, this is not used as a routine source unless there's an additional need for those lines. And then finally, the central laboratory requires the largest sample size and the longest resulting time because of that need to transport the agents. And it is not portable. It is, however, by far the most accurate method of testing glucose. There is some uh, risk of infection depending on how that glucose level is being uh, obtained. And there is some risk because it could be um, subject to contamination, for example, if it's drawn from a line that, uh, from which dextrose is running. Um, there can be other issues because it's not as standardized. Now, in terms of uh, comparisons and predictions of, of what methods might be affected by different clinical characteristics, there was a recent systematic review. And what they found was uh, capillary blood glucose testing on all of these studies, which since this was done five years ago, tends to be older methods. The accuracy was associated with age a low perfusion index, vasopressor use, edema, and a number of other factors were not associated with accuracy, including body mass index, severity of illness, um, some laboratory parameters. In this review, there were fewer um, inaccuracies associated with arterial blood gas measurement, um, but they did note that um, sicker patients who had the need for vasopressors, who had hypotension, um, uh, did have some inaccuracy compared to central um, laboratory measurements. So these are something to consider. Test strips are divided into either amperometric detection or colorimetric detection, depending upon whether the glucose signal is uh, detected via electronic means or via a uh, light source. And there could be two different enzymes involved in either of these measurement processes, glucose oxidase and glucose dehydrogenase. And the importance of these enzymes is that they are susceptible to different interferences. In both cases, the Hydration status of the patient, the pH of, of the patient is important, but in particular, glucose oxidase can be affected by ambient oxygen levels within the blood, and glucose dehydrogenase, as we will discuss, has some other possible interferences, particularly with respect to other types of sugars. There are three main sources of error when it comes to glucose measurement. There are pre-analytical errors, which really just involve the collection of the sample, the environment in which the sample is collected, and uh, in particular, the patient technique. And in the case of point of care bedside glucose testing, it's really important that the personnel that are collecting the samples um, have been adequately trained. Analytical errors, on the other hand, 
might involve the actual measurement process itself. And so some sources might be, as I stated in the case of glucose dehydrogenase, other sugars, and sorbic acid and acetaminophen might interfere on this process, as well as um, other, other things like oxygenation, the hematocrit, and pH. Host analytical errors are really a result of just inadequate coordination and timing of those results. And it might mean that it could be uh, attributed to the wrong patient, it could be a transcription error, there could be a verbal communication error. And in particular, these types of errors can be addressed with better technology, such as patient barcoding and wireless transmission. Pre-analytical errors are, in fact, the most common source of error. And when devices are studied in quality control um, uh, practices, this is not always captured uh, because we might just use a split sample and just measure one uh, assay versus another and not the entire process of collection. So these might include coding and calibration issues, they might include um, poor technique or contamination of the test strips, uh, poor application of, of the sample. In the case of the um, test strip storage, uh, there could be issues with expired test strips or any kind of environmental issue. And there are several ways that over the years, manufacturers have addressed these issues. As I mentioned, barcoding, can also help with the, with the calibration and coding issues so that um, becomes minimized. The um, sample um, can be tested for uh, the correct volume and uh, temperature, and users can be forced to enter in an ID, and those access can be controlled um, by training logs. And so here's a list of uh, some potential confounding variables with, with respect to glucose measurement and how they might be relevant with the different assay testing um, enzymes. So glucose, ox uh, glucose oxidase and uh, glucose dehydrogenase can both be affected by changes in hemoglobin levels, both up or down and glucose oxidase in particular because oxygen is important for the reaction itself uh, can be affected by um, oxygenation levels. Both superoxygenation as can occur in patients who are undergoing cardiothoracic surgery and um, during hypoxia. Acidosis and alkalosis again is part of the this um, process. The acid base um, uh, status is, is really um, important for an enzymatic reaction. Um, hypothermia, um, hypotension, uh, these, these factors could potentially affect both uh, types of enzymes. And then other um, kinds of interference, hypertriglyceridemia, meth hemoglobin. Now drugs have a variety of potential mechanisms by which they might interfere with uh, these uh, two types of assays. Acetaminophen and uh, ascorbic acid in large doses can uh, affect these um, assays, although several of the methodologies do attempt to correct for this. Um, dopamine uh, cases have been reported, and in the case of glucose dehydrogenase, one particular enzyme, the PQQ enzyme, is affected by a number of other sugars, particularly maltose, but also uh, less commonly xylose. Icodextrin, icodextrin is a peritoneal dialysis fluid sugar and uh, lactose mannose. Um, now, with respect to those, those other sugars, Many manufacturers have replaced that PQQ enzyme now with um, other cofactors like NED or FAD. So that 
is really minimized today, but it was an issue um, a few years ago before that re-engineering has taken place. Um, in addition, um, the protein itself um, has also been altered in, in um, some cases to increase that specificity for the enzyme to glucose and not other sugars. Here's a description of a number of different assay methodologies in terms of the enzyme that is utilized, the sample size, the time for results, and the sample types. And you'll notice that there are a couple of point of care methodologies, the stat strip, which do allow for capillary glucose sampling in the ICU and uh, have that, that indication by the FDA. You'll also notice in the hematocrit column, um, there are a number of methodologies that are not affected by hematocrit. And we'll discuss that in more detail. Now, the GDHPQQ enzyme, as I've stated, has been associated with some aberrant glucose readings in the presence of other sugars. Perhaps the most uh, notoriety was obtained by the use of icodextrin, which results essentially in elevated glucose readings and inappropriate administration of insulin. And a number of years ago, these adverse events were reported and had even resulted in some deaths. However, many of these interferences can be handled with um, some technological advances. For example, additional um, electrodes uh, can be uh, utilized to adjust for the chemical interference that can be um, associated with acetaminophen and ascorbic acid. And in this particular slide, there is a comparison of a number of different assay methodologies. So the stat strip one and two, you can see in the black here, has very little um, interferences from um, in either of these substances. And uh, really minimal or no interference actually from um, other sugars and uh, uric acid, for example, or in sodium. A few of the other assay methodologies are affected by different substances. So um, both the Optium in this case and the AccuCheck um, were affected by ascorbic acid. And um, these are important considerations in patients who are getting high doses of ascorbic acid for whatever reason. Hematocrit effects are critical when considering the accuracy of uh, point of care glucose measurements. Um, point of care me glucose meters measure glucose using whole blood, and then those results are then converted to a plasma value. And that conversion factor is about 11%. And that's because of the displacement of glucose. Um, by proteins in uh, the intracellular um, compartment compared to plasma. Now, at a higher hematocrit, that conversion factor is less than 11% because you've, you've got more of the um, uh, red blood cells in your sample that are then displacing um, the glucose measurement, and you will get a falsely low glucose measurement as a result. At a low hematocrit, it's just the opposite. So the conversion factor will wind up being greater than 11%, and you will have a falsely high glucose reading. There are several methods that manufacturers have used to address this effective hematocrit. In the case of the stat strip, the hematocrit is directly measured, and then the assay um, uh, corrects for hematocrit values that way. Um, there are dynamic um, algorithms that um, can correct for hematocrit uh, 
The YSI actually measures plasma directly, so that's not an issue. In arterial blood glass measurements, those are direct glucose measurements. And then some meters, like the HemaQ, actually lights the, the red blood cells, and so that minimizes that differential between plasma and intracellular glucose. We will pause here. We'll take questions at the end, but right now I want to um, hand it over to Dr. Wine. Thank you so much. I'm Kitty Wine. I'm an adult endocrinologist here at The Ohio State University. My focus is primarily on type 1 diabetes management, both in the hospital and in the outpatient setting. Now that Dr. Dungan has described the history of the hospital glucose targets, the challenges of glucose monitoring in the hospital, and the options that we have available to us, I will address how our system has developed a program to assess when to safely use finger stick glucose monitoring throughout the hospital, including the ICU setting. First, I'd like to raise the question of how do we decide if glucose monitoring should be used for our patients in the hospital? We know that only about 33% of people admitted to the hospital have diabetes, and certainly those people should have glucose monitoring ordered. But the other two-thirds of the people are often hyperglycemic or at risk for hyperglycemia, so we need to think about which categories need glucose monitoring ordered. For example, people at risk for diabetes, this could be based on obesity, race, ethnicity, known coronary artery disease, history of stroke, or admitted with a stroke, et cetera. Additionally, People who have illnesses that may involve inflammation of or injury to the pancreas, such as pancreatitis. And then also the patients who are receiving corticosteroid therapy, whether prednisone, dexamethasone. And patients with nutrition support, such as TPN or tube feeds, those can be associated with hyperglycemia in the hospital. And then also, any patient who had elevated glucose on their admission lab should be considered for glucose monitoring while in the hospital. So how do we decide if finger stick monitoring can be used for our patients in the hospital? This is a question of how do you balance the convenience of rapid result versus accuracy in critically ill patients? That leads to the question of what defines critically ill when performing finger stick glucose, and who can make that determination? Can we find a way to make it easy for any and all members of the team to determine if it's okay to do the finger stick glucose monitoring? Or are there so many confounders that we should consider just banning finger sticks from the hospital completely? I would argue that the convenience of the rapid result outweighs the idea of banning finger sticks, but we really do need a systematic approach to determining if it's reasonable and safe to do finger stick monitoring and to take therapeutic actions based on those results. So I'm going to start with a case that really brought this issue to my attention. Our endocrine team was consulted for evaluation of hypoglycemia in the ICU. This was a 58-year-old woman with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis who also had coronary artery disease and peripheral vascular disease and had been admitted with hypotension and sepsis. She had no known history of diabetes and no known history of sulfonylurea ingestion. When we arrived to the ICU, we found that she was hypotensive but alert and interactive. Her hands were pale and cool to touch. So we asked the question, where did you obtain the blood to check the finger stick? And we were shown which finger on which hand was used for the first and the second and the third, all of which showed very low numbers between 30. 
We then did another one, which was also 26. However, at that point, we drew a simultaneous sample from her brachial vein in the contralateral arm, and we found that that value was 150. Now, to me as an endocrinologist, it was very obvious that when someone has known vascular disease and their hands are pale and cool to the touch, we should not be doing finger sticks. But this raised the question of how do we make that decision in the hospital, who makes the decision, and where should we obtain the blood from if we're not able to use the finger stick. So in this case, if the BRAVE criteria had been applied, then the finger stick would have been avoided and glucose would have only been measured on arterial blood. And you're probably sitting here saying, well, what is the BRAVE criteria? And that's what I'm going to go through in the next few slides, and then I'll show you some applications of it. The key here was to develop a systematic approach to determining which patients could have finger stick glucose monitoring and in which scenarios should we use arterial blood for the point of care testing instead of using the finger stick. So what is BRAVE criteria? It's a patient assessment that is done at the bedside. It's very simple, it's very easy and rapid to determine if the finger stick can be used for obtaining the glucose sample to check the point of care glucose. So BRAVE stands for the five criteria we use to determine if there's a reason to exclude this person from being eligible for the use of capillary blood to monitor their blood glucose. The first is the B, which stands for blood pressure. Then R, which stands for reduced capillary refill rate. A is for, for acidosis from DKA or HHNK, the hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic state. V is for the use of vasopressors. And E is for edema. Now to give you a little bit more information about these components, and keep in mind that you only need one of them to exclude the use of capillary blood for your glucose measurement. The first one, the B, is blood pressure. And that would be a systolic blood pressure below 80 millimeters mercury or a mean arterial pressure below 50 millimeters mercury. The R for reduced capillary refill rate would be capillary refill greater than three seconds. A is acidosis, whether diabetic ketoacidosis or hyperosmolar non-ketoacidosis. Vasopressors, this is specifically addressing intravenous vasopressors. So either any dose of norepinephrine, phenylephrine, or vasopressin, or epinephrine at a dose greater than or equal to 0.06 micrograms per kilogram per minute, or dopamine at greater than 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Then E for edema at the collection site would be if the fingers had pitting edema, blue or purplish discoloration. This slide shows the clinical workflow of how the process works. And initially, the RN will assess the patient to determine if any of the BRAVE criteria are present. If the person does not meet BRAVE criteria, then the RN or the PCA will proceed with obtaining the capillary specimen to check the glucose, as shown on the top part of this flow sheet. If the person do, does meet one or more of the BRAVE criteria, then the workflow goes to the bottom part, which is where either venous or arterial blood is obtained for the glucose measurement. This is then indicated in the computer just below the, blood gluco the glucose reading as to what the source of the blood was. The BRAVE criteria is now applied by all of our staff every time they go to do a blood glucose measurement. What this next slide shows you is 
what units were found to most frequently have someone who met BRAVE criteria, therefore requiring an alternate source of glucose. And this is separating the units by rehab, intensive care, general medicine, cancer, the cardiovascular floors, mixed medical surgical floors, and surgical floors. And this is looking at three sequential months that I've labeled as month one, month two, and month three. And what you see very quickly is the people who most commonly met criteria were number one found in the cardiovascular floors, and then pretty equally between the ICU and the cancer floors. And then to a much lower extent, we'd find them in the med surge, in the surgical, and in the general medicine floors. However, regardless of the rates of how often people met the criteria, we still continue to apply it every time we go to draw blood to try to ensure the accuracy of our measurement for the patients. Here is an example of how we would proceed with applying the BRAVE criteria. Now, this first case that I mentioned to you, the patient who was in the ICU with peripheral vascular disease, coronary disease, and kidney disease on hemodialysis. When we look at the criteria, the first one of blood pressure, she definitely did meet the low blood pressure criteria, so that one was a yes. She also had reduced capillary refill, so that was yes also. She did not have any of the other three criteria. But irregardless, remember I said you only need one criteria to then not use the capillary specimen. If we had had the BRAVE criteria at the time uh, that patient was in the hospital, then we actually would not have required the endocrine consultation because the ICU team would have ascertained that she really wasn't adequately perfusing her fingers and they would not have used that as a source for the glucose. So that's really the value of this criteria is to determine when someone is not going to have a valid glucose due to poor perfusion and acidosis and preventing us from making a therapeutic decision based on a glucose that may or may not have been accurate at that time. So to reinforce the idea that this is very simple, it's a bedside assessment, and it's easy to apply to any patient, what I'm going to do now is go through a series of case examples where we looked at the BRAVE criteria and made a decision of how to obtain their glucose, then continued to reassess throughout the person's hospitalization. This next case is a 29-year-old man who presented with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and was found to have pancreatitis. He was admitted to the SICU for monitoring. His blood pressure was low, but he did not require press or support. Blood glucose was ordered every six hours because he was NPO. Upon application of the BRAVE criteria, it was determined that he did have one of the criteria, which was the fact that his systolic blood pressure was intermittently below 80 millimeters mercury. So arterial blood was then used for his blood glucose checks. Case three is a 42-year-old obese male who presented to the emergency department with abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, and was found to have appendicitis. Post-op, he was admitted to the med surge floor. Blood glucose was ordered to six hours. The BRAVE criteria was applied and found to have none of the criteria present, so the team proceeded with using capillary blood for his blood glucose checks. Case four is a 38-year-old woman admitted for same-day surgery for a Roux-en-Y bariatric procedure. She was admitted to the SICU post-op. She reported a known history of type 2 diabetes along with a body mass index of greater than 40. She was NPO post-op and reported that she had not taken any insulin that morning prior to admission. Blood glucose checks were ordered every six hours. Brave criteria was zero out of five. 
so capillary blood was used for her blood glucose checks. Case 5 a, is a 72-year-old slender woman with a hyperosmolar state. She was brought to the ED by her family for evaluation of confusion. The admission labs showed a glucose of 1,700, a creatinine of 3.4, and a beta-hydroxybutyrate that was very low at 0.02 millimoles per liter. She was initiated on insulin infusion with Q1 hour glucose checks. When the BRAVE criteria was applied, she was found to have two of the criteria, which would be the hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic state and also reduced capillary refill. She was originally monitored Q1 hour with arterial blood. However, she was continually reassessed, and on hospital day two, she had zero of the five BRAVE criteria, so was transitioned to using capillary blood for her glucose checks. Case six is a 49-year-old woman who was brought to the ICU after a four-vessel cabbage. She has a known history of type 2 diabetes, and she's on multiple pressors, including high-dose norepinephrine. Blood glucose checks were ordered for every six hours. She was found to have three of the five BRAVE criteria. This included pressors, low blood pressure, and reduced capillary refill. Arterial blood was then used for her glucose checks. On post-op day number three, she is weaned off the pressors. However, at that point, she still had one of the five criteria present, which was reduced capillary refill, so she continued on arterial blood being used for the glucose checks for another day. Once the BRAVE criteria reduced to zero, she transitioned to capillary blood being used for the glucose checks. Case 7 is a 23-year-old man who presents to the ED with abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, and was found to have DKA. His pH was 6.9, glucose 775, beta-hydroxybutyrate very elevated at 11.2, and a creatinine of 2.3 showing dehydration. He was initiated on IV fluids and insulin infusion. Blood glucose checks were ordered every one hour with the insulin infusion. On assessment of BRAVE criteria, he was found to have one of the five criteria, which is DKA, so arterial blood was used for the glucose checks. This was continued until after his anion gap had closed, at which time he transitioned to capillary blood glucose checks. Case 8 is a 58-year-old man who was admitted with intractable nausea and vomiting after chemotherapy infusion. He was initiated on IV fluids and antiemetics. Blood glucose checks were ordered for every six hours. Brave criteria showed that one of the five was present, which was reduced capillary refill. So we proceeded with using arterial blood for his blood glucose checks. The next morning, the BRAVE criteria had reduced to zero out of five, so he was transitioned to capillary blood glucose being used for his checks. Case 9 is a 68-year-old man who presented to the ED complaining of swelling and yellow eyes. He was found to have jaundice, new onset ascites, and anasarca. He was admitted for management of liver failure. He did have a known history of type 2 diabetes. Blood glucose checks were ordered. He was found to have one of the five BRAVE criteria, specifically pitting edema in all his extremities, so arterial blood was used for his glucose checks. Case 10 is our last example. This is a man who was admitted with euglycemic DKA. He is a 53-year-old man who presented to the ED with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and dehydration. He had known type 2 diabetes with the recent addition of an SGLT inhibitor to his regimen. His admission lab showed a glucose of 175, a bicarb of 5, creatinine of 2.1, beta-hydroxybutyrate of 7.3 millimoles.
units per liter. He was initiated on IV fluids and insulin infusion. The blood glucose was ordered Q1 hour initially because of the insulin infusion, and he was determined to have one of the five BRAVE criteria, which was DKA. So initially, he arterial blood was used for his glucose checks. Then as the DKA resolved, he was transitioned to capillary blood glucose. So what I've showed you with these clinical examples is that the BRAVE criteria is very easily applied at the bedside. Many clinical scenarios will require the use of an alternate blood source such as arterial instead of capillary blood. However, the majority of hospital patients do not meet BRAVE criteria and therefore can be monitored with routine finger sticks. So what we've tried to do today is give you an idea of the current glucose targets in the hospital, the importance of not being too far outside those ranges, the evolution of blood glucose testing standards and methodology, then the challenges of trying to monitor glucose in the hospital, both starting with using a glucose meter that's approved throughout the hospital, and including the ICU, but also using a simple strategy such as the BRAVE criteria to determine if it's appropriate to use capillary blood from a finger stick in a critically ill patient, and if not, to know when you can then transition to using the capillary blood. And in this simple assessment of the person's clinical status, you can then increase your chances that you're getting an accurate glucose measurement that can then be safely used to make therapeutic decisions and specifically whether or not to give insulin and how much. In our first few months applying this BRAVE criteria, we've actually seen a significant decrease in hypoglycemia related to insulin therapy. So we really feel that not only have we found a easy way to determine who should not be assessed with capillary glucose, but we've also increased the safety of our therapeutic decisions in our hospital patients. Thank you so much for listening to us today, and now we'll move on to opening up for questions. Thank you. We will start by answering the questions that have been submitted throughout the presentation, but please, as instructed at the beginning, continue to submit your questions just by typing them in. Well, let me start by thanking uh, Dr. Dungan for the excellent overview of uh, blood glucose uh, monitoring systems and Dr. Wine for a really interesting uh, take on when to perform capillary testing uh, for point-of-care glucose uh, measurements uh, using capillary sampling. Uh, we will now, I mean, uh, take any questions. You can type your questions in the Q&A uh, uh, box. Uh, available. And I will start it off by asking Dr. Wine a quick question while the other uh, questions are coming in. And you, you spoke about uh, criteria to sample capillary or for capillary sampling uh, for blood glucose testing. Uh, does this, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned a little bit at the end, uh, what, you know, that you use this on critically ill patients. Uh, my question to you is, um, this is most likely very different than what you define critically ill at your institution, because I'm pretty sure a lot of people still struggle with this with this question. Can you, you know, briefly comment on the idea of, of making sure we have appropriate sampling capillary, whether it's critically ill and uh, or not, and that the, the fact that the BRAVE criteria are not the definition for critically ill per se, they're just a uh, an assessment of when you're able to do a capillary testing. 
And I think what you've done is really highlighted the point that this is something that we use as an assessment in all patients. And what we're looking for is a systematic approach to determine if someone is under perfusing. So if they have, you know, very low blood pressure, reduced capillary refill, um, the acidosis, or someone who's on vasopressors. The other concern that we've often heard expressed from our ICU teams is, well, what about the person who has a lot of edema? And again, this is a way to very simply and quickly assess them and determine if reasonably will the capillary blood glucose be accurate. So, so you are correct, this isn't just for critically ill patients, it's for a wide variety of scenarios. And while when I first heard about it, yes, I thought this was a huge burden, it's going to be so much work, but the nurses taught me that this was very quick and they really jumped on it and felt more confident in their care because they were being able to make a decision of whether or not it was appropriate to use the finger stick blood for the glucose determination. Um, thank you for the uh, the answer. I have a, a similar and a similar question from Corinne Kirk from Stevens Community Medical Center. The question is: the Novastat report was recently approved for critical ill. Do we still use Brave criteria? So I, think I, I would. I personally would argue yes. That's my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is I, I believe this is a question uh, from Dr. Dungan. Do you have any advice for me to use in a hyperbaric chamber? Wow, that's a great question. I'm not sure that any of these meters have been really evaluated in under a high pressure um, situation. And certainly we know at very low altitudes, um, you know, some of these um, assays could be affected and that's primary, that's um, at least in part, a, uh, an oxygenation issue, um, which many of these meters uh, already account for. Um, but at the the partial pressure is is really the the question, and I can't answer that. I, I think that yeah. somehow you'd have to be able to do some assessment in between. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll I'll try to answer this. Uh, I mean, I would direct anybody with a question like this to go to the IFU of the individual meter because there you will find the uh, rec you know the recommended criteria for when and how to use a meter whether it's temperature whether it's uh, humidity and all this and, and try to use the meter within those uh, established criteria these are the criteria that were uh, for any meter that were actually uh, submitted to the FDA that's what the the range of temperatures, pressures, everything that you can use a meter for. So, you know, my advice is, is go to the IFU for that meter and see what is included in the package insert uh, for the meter. Uh, I have a question from, uh, I believe, okay, from San Francisco General uh, UCSF. Uh, how was the BRAVE criteria implemented? Is the BRAVE policy reflected in the point of care glucose procedure? How was it implemented? I'm not totally sure I understand the question, but it was implemented um, as a hospital-wide policy, and um, the, the nursing staff was educated on how to use it, and then each time they did a blood glucose from the time we implemented it, they would document in the computer what the source of the glucose is, so when I look at a glucose value, a point of care glucose value, I'll see right above it um, what the source of the blood was. I'm, I'm assuming the question was, uh, I think it, it's more of a clinical assessment that is handled by nursing, not a, a part of the point of care uh, SOP or procedure for glucose. I think that Correct. was probably, yeah, what the question was. And I Correct, think it, it's a nursing probably, procedure. Yeah. Yep. Uh, from Baylor University Medical Center, uh, does your facility allow capillary testing using earlobe? We occasionally get this request from physicians. Do you want me to try to answer that based on, for example, uh, the intended use? Uh, 
uh, of a pony care glucose uh, system? Yes. Uh, so, so I'll, I'll answer from a manufacturer's pers uh, perspective is that uh, the only approved sample type is what is in the intended use in a package insert for the different point care systems. So if somebody requests earlobe and it is not in the package insert, it means it wasn't approved by the FDA as, a, as, a, as an approved sample type. So this ends up, you'll end up in a situation where this is off-label use and, and uh, uh, people kind of uh, tend to shy away from it. So basically, as a manufacturer, it's following the uh, intended use uh, population and the sample types that are in the IFU or the package insert. All right, so uh, I hope this has answered the question. I will, um, uh, this is a similar question. Uh, the brief criteria is great. Is this criteria in your policy or in your EMR? I believe we answered that earlier. Um, this is a question from Nova Scotia Health Authority. Were studies done on using glucose meters on neonatal population? These patients have a tendency to have elevated hematopoiesis, and will this have an impact on the results? Um, Dr. Dungan, you want to take a stab at this? Um, there are some limited studies in neonatal populations, but again, that's also really um, critical to kind of look at your package insert and, and determine that um, your device is approved in that population. Okay. Um, this is a question for Dr. Wynn, uh, Dr. Wine uh, specifically. Was venous blood as accurate as arterial when the BRAVE criteria were met? That's an interesting question. Yeah, it is an interesting question. Um, I'm trying to think because really all the examples that I ran through are ones where we either had a discrepancy or we had no reason to use the to use alternate sources of blood. I'd have to go back and look and see if we have any data where we're comparing the two sources head to head in that situation. I would wonder anecdotally if you would get more of those really one off um, issues where you know you're much more likely to accidentally draw blood from a a line that's containing dextrose with a venous sample than with an arterial sample. So that's just really more of a practical issue. All right. Um, another question regarding the BRAVE criteria. Uh, can the BRAVE criteria be applied to the pediatric population? I would love to do that study, but I would think yes. Okay. Um, Okay, this is a question. What are the current guidelines for comparison testing between point of care meters and the central lab? We currently use 15 milligram difference of under 75 and 15% over 75. Um, Dr. Dungan, do you want to uh, talk about this? Hello? Hello? You think maybe we lost her and she'll be back in a moment? I'm sorry, yeah, I'm uh, on mute. Okay. I apologize. Um, yeah, so the, these, these, um, these standards have uh, gone through a bit of an evolution over the past uh, several years and the FDA is a little bit different than you know the, some of the um, different standards that are out there which commonly are the ISO standards. Um, the most recent compromise I believe was a 95 percent within 12 uh, percent um, criterion for glucose um, greater than 75 
uh, milligram per deciliter and uh, within 12 milligram per deciliter if uh, glucose is less than 75 milligram per deciliter. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, this is the uh, current CLSI POCT12 uh, guidance that is intended for hospitals to use as, as guidance. So these are the criteria from the CLSI POCT12 uh, that people can review. Um, a question here uh, on arterial blood. Uh, when arterial blood is used for your sample, is it performed on the bedside glucose meter or the blood gas analyzer? Um, we use it on the meter. Yeah, okay. Um, here's another question from Orange Regional Medical Center. Uh, how does this impact nursing workflow? Many units have med techs or medical assistants performing point of care. So the the truth is it's the, well, for us, it's a, a PCA who's doing the finger stick glucose. But I, I really kind of alluded to it that the initial assessment is done by the RN. And each shift, the RN is going to do their own assessment on whether or not they think it's appropriate. But actually, the PCA is assisting it also. And as I mentioned, it's a very simple assessment. So, for example, the RN knows the person's on vasopressor, so they don't even call for a finger stick measurement. Um, but if they believe that it's safe to do it, then they will call for a finger stick. But even so, the PCAs, I've seen them make the decision where they go to the nurse and say, I don't think it's appropriate at this point in time. And as I said, it's, it's another piece where all of them really feel engaged and feel some ownership in this. And it was amazing to me how engaged they are in this process. All right. Um, th thanks for the answer. Uh, with this, I believe we're uh, over our uh, one hour time limit. Um, uh, PDF slides of, of our handouts of these presentations will be made available. Uh, uh, an email will be sent out uh, after this uh, program is over with a link to get continuing education credits, and then we will make available uh, both Dr. Dungan and Dr. Wine uh, kindly accepted to make the uh, handouts available. Uh, we apologize we're not able to uh, go over all the uh, questions that we we got, we try to uh, uh, answer as many as as we can, and hopefully thank we thank everybody for uh, attending and listening, and hopefully we'll uh, have you in uh, future programs as well. Thank you, everybody.